like was mentioned, we're in Nehemiah chapter 5 today. So if you would, grab your Bibles or a device by which you can access the Bible and turn to Nehemiah. It's an Old Testament book, um, chapter 5, but we'll be starting in Nehemiah 4, just for a little bit of context today. But as you see on the screen, we have been navigating a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter series through this book. This visual and this verbiage really lends itself towards the lens by which we are taking in this book. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we'll we'll read it in just a few moments, but it talks about how the individuals who were at work in rebuilding the wall had a weapon in one hand and a tool for building in the other. For us, we have a, a shovel and a sword there to remind us of that, that life as a Christian is both a bouquet and a battle. It's this dynamic where God does amazing things in your life and brings new life. Roses and rainbows, if you want to look at it that way. But there's also challenge. There's also problems. There's also work to be done and a battle to fight. But here's the beautiful thing about Nehemiah. It's not just a historical book of how the Jews went from a time of exile back into the land of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. It's not just that, though it is that. It's a historical, accurate account of what happened in the life of the people of God. But it also, for many of us, reveals to us who Jesus is. See, for all of Scripture points back to Jesus. And in this book, here's one of the lessons we learn about Jesus. Jesus can rebuild and restore. Whether or not in your life you're experiencing a dynamic of deconstruction or rubble by your own hand or by the hand of another, by your own choices or choices that were made for you, here's the beautiful truth. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. Jesus can rebuild. Jesus can restore, but listen to this, only for the initiated, only for those who will willingly and willfully surrender head, heart, and hands to God's will, God's way, and God's word. See, the relationship with God is participatory. It's a tango. You know, how many does it take to to tango? Does anybody know? Yeah, you need need to have a partner. See, God wants to be the leader. You've got to be there with him and let him lead. And you do that through the A, B, C, D, and E's of your life. Your attitude, your belief, your choices, your decisions, your experiences and examples. Show me who you are. That's what you are. Your attitude, your belief your choices, your decisions, the experiences of your life, that is your testimony. It's not about what you say or some creed that you hold to. It is your life. And here's the beautiful truth of Nehemiah. Jesus can rebuild. Jesus can restore if you want him to. Now, here's the thing. Last time we were in the book of Nehemiah, does anyone know what chapter we were in? It rhymes with boar, but it was not. It's chapter chapter 4. You're a very bright bunch. Brighter than the 9 o'clock. Don't tell them we said that. If you were in 9 o'clock, say, hey, what happened here? I'm coming to both. Anyway. But in chapter 4, here's the dynamic that we see. Perhaps you remember. The people of God came under attack from an enemy that is foreign, not domestic. See, in chapter 4, there were those who were bringing ridicule, conspiracy, discouragement, and intimidation to the people of God and the work of God that was happening in the city of God known as Jerusalem. The walls were being rebuilt, and the enemies of God that were foreign began sowing imagination and speculation 
began spinning a web of stories of conspiracy, began ridiculing, brought discouragement, and even tried to intimidate the people of God. And you know what the people of God did? They just Netflix and chilled. No, 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 no. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 15, so we can gain context for our text today. And in respect of, and in the authority of God's word, I'd like to ask you to stand while I read Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, but this text gives us context of Nehemiah chapter 5. If you're in Nehemiah 4 and at verse 15, let me know by saying, Jesus rebuilds and restores. Okay, verse 15. Here's what happens when the people of God experience problem and challenge. Verse 15. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late, sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. Verse 22, I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way they and their servants could help with the guard duty at night and work during the day. And I think verse 23, my two sons, Liam and Leo, they would love this verse. You say, why? Well, listen to it. During this time, none of us, not I or my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. Say, what do you mean? They always like to be clothed. They don't like to take a bath. And that's what these boys were doing. Like, we're working so hard, we're not even bathing. And some of the, you know, anyway. Well, he said, we carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for a water break. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that now I would be able to serve your people well by giving explanation of the word, but Lord, more importantly, that your spirit would bring illumination of your word to the hearts and to the minds of every single person in this room or joining us online or even perhaps listening at a later time. Lord, I know that there are, are, are some who are at the end of their rope. They're looking to you for restoration and rebuilding. I pray that you'd begin to do that work today. Bless us now as we, we read and study your word. May you show us more of your son, Jesus. And may our heart, head, and hands align with his will. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. You may be seated. You see, in the book of Nehemiah, there's this dynamic in play. God had given a call to Nehemiah, a plan, a vision. It was to return to his homeland and to see the walls around the city of Jerusalem rebuilt. The people of God had been in exile for at least 70 years, and it was time to return. And here's the dynamic. Always, always. When God gives a call, you should expect challenge. Always, when God providentially gives a plan, expect for there to be problems. And if you look at Nehemiah, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, you can see foreign enemies in chapter 4 and in chapter 6. And then the chapter in which we look at today, we see domestic enemies. 
that there's actually an attack from within. And let me have your attention, let me see your eyes. This is the way it always is for the people of God. There are challenges from without and from within. And here's what I find so interesting. In chapter 4, the people of God are experiencing discouragement, conspiracy, ridicule, and intimidation from foreign enemies. And you know what they do? They link arms. They work hard. They respond. When the enemy is visible, they respond. When they know that it's foreign, they're on guard. So much so they're not even bathing. Like when they're going to get a water break, they've got their sword ready. These people are on their toes. They're ready for the fight. But then chapter 5 comes. I don't know if you're in a sermon-based connect group, but one of the supplemental resources we're encouraging the sermon-based groups to, to use as a help is a little book called Be Determined by Warren Wearsby. Little little book. I like little books. I don't like big books. I like little books. And I like little books that have application questions. So that's what those books are. But in this little book, or booklet, if you want to call it that, Warren opens up his commentary on this chapter, chapter 5, with these words. And I wanted to read them to you because I think they're so just apropos. Listen to what he says. When the enemy fails in his attacks from the outside, he then begins to attack from within. And one of his favorite weapons is selfishness. If he can get us thinking only about ourselves, what we want, then he will win the victory before we realize that he's even at work. Selfishness, Wearsby says, means putting myself at the center of everything and insisting on getting what I want when I want it. It means exploiting others so I can be happy and taking advantage of them just so I can have my own way. It's not only wanting my own way, but expecting everyone else to want my way too to agree with whatever I think. I like what he says here. Why are selfish people so miserable? He quotes Thomas Mirton, and he says, this is what he said. To consider persons, events, and situations only in the light of their effect upon myself is to live on the doorstep of hell. This is the culture you live in, where we're not only encouraged but expected that whatever your sexual orientation is, we must just say, okay. This is the culture that you're in, that if what you want, when you want it, how you want it is what you want, then we must agree, or else we are not being kind. But what happens when the hand of your freedom hits the face of another? What happens when your ideology, when your perspective, when your choices begin to impact the choices, perspective, or values of another? You have called conflict. Then who is right? Whoever is strongest is who is right. That's how this ends. Unless you have a standard, the strong becomes the standard. And the strong will destroy the weak. That's what's happened in every other preceding generation. Why would you assume that yours is any more privileged than the preceding? Without absolute standards, you can absolutely expect things to fall. You must have an absolute, or else there is no bearing. There is no way to tell what a straight line is without a straight line. There is no way to tell what light is unless there's definition of light and darkness. 
and the challenge that many of us face is we seek to think outside the box before we know the book. My mentor challenged me, Neil, you be one who always thinks outside the box, but never outside the book. And we have so many people that would identify as believers that are trying to think outside the box that don't know the book. And in this chapter, here's what's so interesting, so illuminative, in my opinion, to where we are in the 21st century. It's not the attack from without. It's the attack from within. Christians don't know their Bibles. They don't live it. How do you know? Look at the attitude. Look at the belief. Look at the choices. Look at how they react when they're kind of like, when their schedule goes out of line. You know, that's when you can kind of tell when someone's, what they're like. Like when the bridge is out and they said March and then it's May, look at what, how the person responds. Like, okay, I might have some grace there, but also you're also showing your heart. Like, hey, you said that I would have what I want, when I want it, how I want it. Now you're telling me I can't? Yeah, welcome to life. Life doesn't orient itself to your values, opinions, or desires or needs. In this chapter this morning, we're going to see four scenes, four scenes of things that happen. And just to help us remember them, I'm going to entitle them with R's, shock, right? Like my kids, Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, Leo. Well, I like alliteration, it helps me. And in this chapter, here's what we'll see today, ruthlessness, reprimand, repentance, and role model. Verses 1 through 5 we see the ruthlessness of the people of God. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. If you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus rebuilds and restores. Attack is happening. They're fighting. They're building the wall. And in verse 1, what happens? About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families. Yeah, I know what that's like. And we need more food to survive. Others said, we've mortgaged our fields and vineyards and homes to get food during famine. And others said, we had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. And we belong to the same family of those who are wealthy and our children are just like theirs, yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We've already sold some of our daughters and we are helpless to do anything about it for our fields and our vineyards are already mortgaged to others. This is one of the saddest chapters in the book of Nehemiah. It's one of the only chapters where no building is recorded. There's no activity from the people of God. There starts to be challenge from within, and so what happens? What happens everywhere in an organization or a family where the people aren't aligned with what they should be doing? Sideways energy must be invested. There's no more building that can be done because we've got problems from within. So what happens? Well, there's a time of famine. There were taxes for people to pay. So what did they do? Well, those of affluence were selfishly exploiting the poor in order to make themselves rich. They were using their platform to rob some and to put others into bondage. And here's the challenge. The people of God, instead of maybe supporting and, and praying for one another, they were praying on one another. It's a kill or be killed mindset. It's ruthless. It's this dynamic of, well, hey, me and my kids are good, so why should I worry about you? In fact, if you have an issue and I've got resource and you don't, Maybe I can make profit off of that. It's ruthless what's happening here. But here's what I find so interesting. How, how does Nehemiah respond? It's in verses 6 through 11. Does he say, well, you know, boys will be boys. It, it is what it is. The rich just get richer and the poor just get poor. That's the way of the world. What does he say? Look at verse 6. This is where the reprimand comes in. He says, when I heard their complaints... I was angry. But, I love verse 7, after thinking it over, he doesn't react. 
He responds. There's a difference there. He said, I, I, I spoke out against these nobles and officials, and I told them, you're hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. He makes his, you know, challenge here very clear. And then what does he do? If you're going to do this publicly, I'm going to bring it into the public. That's what he says. I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. At the meeting, I said to them, we are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have to sell themselves to pagan foreigners, but now you're selling them back into slavery again. And he kind of asked this question, how many times do we have to redeem them? <laughs> From the foreign and domestic here? And they had nothing to say in their defense. So he says, I pressed further. What you're doing is not right. Should you not walk, please pay attention to these words, in the fear of God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations. He says, I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, we've been lending to the people money and grain, but now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day and repay the interest you've charged when you've lent them money, grain, and new wine, and olive oil. I love this. Nehemiah recognizes a true problem, a true challenge. And he doesn't just say, not my circus, not my monkeys. You know what he says? He says, stop it. And let me give you a plan of reconciliation. See, the ministry that you and I are called to is not a ministry of perfection or correction, but a ministry of reconciliation. Read the book of 2 Corinthians, specifically chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. We are called to see things brought into repair and to restore, not just to point out the wrong. See, some of us do that. We see wrong and we get on the social media thing or whatever it is and go, it's wrong, it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's not helpful. Show us the way forward. And that's what Nehemiah does here. He says, listen, here's what's wrong, and here's the pathway to make it right. You, you can't get that if you're a reactionary leader. You only get that way if you're a responsive leader. You must take time to prepare before you produce. I think it was Billy Graham who was once asked near the end of his ministry, if he were to do anything differently, what would he do? He said, I would spend way less time traveling and preaching and more time praying and preparing. Think of the life of Jesus. Think of the life of Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's had a, like a preview coming attraction for like thousands of years, right? Like people are expecting this guy. And what does he do for the first 30 years that he's finally arrived? He prepares. He prepares. And only three years of public ministry. There's something to that. Think about Moses. Moses. Forty years at the backside of the desert preparing. Think of Colonel Sanders. You know who that is? That guy didn't come up with the chicken situation until later in his life. Think of Thomas Edison. Light bulb fail, 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 fail. Oh, there it is. Preparation is always a part of the story of the man or woman that God uses greatly. Because before God can use someone greatly, he must wound them deeply and show them their need for him. Because character matters. Thoughtfulness matters. How you respond when the unexpected hits matters. It matters. And you will not be able to ever have a good substitute for time. I love this. Nehemiah, he just simply says, you know, we got to stop this. And here's what we need to do. And what happens after the reprimand? Look at verses 12 through 13. 
I'm going to call this section repentance. Look at what they do. They replied, we're going to give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. And you know what? We're going to do as you say. Can you imagine if like President Biden recognized economic challenge in America? I know there's not any economic challenge in America, but imagine there was. No, I'm just teasing. But, and he were to say, listen, what's happening here, 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 here in these businesses is wrong. Let me show you why. And here's my plan for you to change. And I want you to do it. And every single financial institution and every other institutions that make money, we won't go into that because that's a dynamic right there. But they all said, sounds good, Prez, let's do it. Can you imagine this? I mean, this is amazing. Like Nehemiah says, here's what's wrong. Here's how we make it right. And the people said, sounds good. That's half the battle. I mean, have you ever been married? Like you ever seen, hey, here's the problem. Here's how to make it right. Let's do it. Sounds good. What the? It actually worked. You know, (laughs) this is amazing. So what does he do? He like jumps on this. Look at the verse 12. He says, well, then I called the priests. (laughs) Let's get these holy people involved. You know, he's like, let's make the nobles and the officials. Let's make them swear to do whatever they promise. He makes it ceremonial. He said, look, you said it. Let's say it before God, right? And then verse 13, he gets a visual out. What does he do? He says, I shook the folds of my robe and I said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and your property. And what do the people say? Amen. It's like, what the? This is amazing. And the people did as they promised. I mean, people can change, right? Look at Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. But what did they do here? They repented. What is repentance? Well, the full biblical definition of repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. Metal. Metanoia, something of that nature. I'm not a Greek guy, but that's how it's, you know, that's the word there. And Hebrew, there's a Hebrew word, but we'll just focus on the Greek one. Calls is called for throughout the Bible. Repentance. What is it? Listen to me. Catch this. Don't miss this. Because this is your part in your relationship with God. So don't miss this. Hopefully you don't miss this. Repentance is a summons to personal, absolute an ultimate, unconditional surrender to God as sovereign. That's what repentance is. It's saying, listen, I don't know. (laughs) What you say is what I say. What you do is now what I do. If you call this sin, I just call it sin. If you call it good, I call it good. I am under your authority. That's what repentance is. And it may include sorrow and regret. Yeah, there's emotions. There can be. Nothing wrong with that. But it's more than that. Repentance is making a complete change towards God. See, one of my mentors once told me this, and I think it's really true. He said, Neil, you can't change your heart. Only God can do that. But you can change your mind. And here's the deal. God will not change your heart unless you're willing to change your mind. But if you will change your mind, then God can do what only he can do. He will change your heart. And this is where the rub is. Most of us don't want to call sin, sin. Most of us don't want to fess up that we're ultimately selfish until you become a parent of almost six kids. Then you realize, they're selfish, I'm selfish, we're all selfish, we all got problems, we all need Jesus, like every single moment of the day. And this is the question I want to ask you at this moment. Is repentance a dynamic of your story, or is it definitive of your story? What do you mean by that? For some people, repentance is this dynamic. Yeah, I walked the aisle. I prayed the prayer. I checked the box. It was a dynamic in my life. And I would say to you, repentance is not a dynamic of the believer. It's definitive of the believer. Every single day, you wake up. And you die to yourself. You pick up your cross and you follow Jesus. Repentance is not a dynamic of your story. 
it is definitive of your morning, afternoon, and evening. You say, what do you mean? i got to get saved every day? No. See, as a Christian, here's what the book of Romans would teach you. If you're a Christian, you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will one day be saved. If you say, I don't get that, then read your Bible. Romans, go for it. It's in there. You can read it. Say, I still don't get it. Keep reading. The Spirit of God will illuminate truth to a heart that's open. Because there is no mediator between God and man except the man Christ Jesus. And one of my mentors once told me this, Neil, you know as much about the Bible as you want. It's not intellectually discerned. It's spiritually discerned. The problem is you don't really care. You're more into Netflix and chilling. You're more into the third hobby you have. You're more into the fifth home that you have. You're more into that new relationship. That is the master passion of your life. So go and worship that false idol and see what it gets you. Here's what happened. The people were ruthless. Nehemiah, he brings a reprimand. No, this can't happen no more. And what do the people do? They actually respond in repentance. And where does this close? Look at Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 14 through 19. If you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus rebuilds and restores. Back row, you still there? All right, I got a thumbs up from the back row. Nehemiah gives himself as an example of a role model. Now, some people have a problem with this. They go, look at this guy. I don't know if I have a good phrase for this, tooting your own horn. I hate that phrase, but I don't know what else to say. But it, that's what some people think this is. See, I don't think Nehemiah knew that when he was writing this or transcribing or whatever, that people in the 21st century American church context would be reading about it. He's just like writing it down. But here's what it says about Nehemiah. He says, verse 14, the entire 12 years that I was governor of Judah, and he cites when that was, 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, Neither I nor my officials drew on the official food allowance. He was the kind of leader that the people right around him, they followed suit. The former governors, in contrast, had laid heavy burdens on people, demanding a daily ration of food and wine, besides 40 pieces of silver. Even their assistants took advantage of the people. Please listen to this. But because I feared God, I did not act that way. Listen, a leader who does not fear God will never fear systems, policies, and procedures. If the leader doesn't fear God, don't follow them. Because I feared God, I didn't act that way. Verse 16, I also devoted myself to working on the wall, refused to acquire any land, and I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall. I asked for nothing. Even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table besides all the visitors from other lands. Phew, that's crazy. The provisions I paid for each day, here's his daily like shipped budget, you know, the delivery situation. I paid each day, this is what it included, one ox, six, six choice sheep or goats, and a large number of poultry. That's an amazing grocery situation. And every 10 days, we needed a large supply of all kinds of wine. Yet I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy burden. Remember, O oh God, that I have done for these people and bless me for it. He's not asking you to remember him. He's just saying, listen, God, I'm just trying to be honest before you. I don't think there's anything wrong with you recording in a journal before the Lord. Lord, this is what I'm doing. FYI. You know, like if you've ever read the Psalms, that's what David does. But here's what I find so interesting. It's been said that real leaders are people who accept more of the blame and less of the credit. And Nehemiah here is one who quietly sacrificed so that others could have some, or not, if not more. He paid his own bills and didn't exploit people. This isn't my phrase, but I definitely resonate with it. Because most people, myself included, are willing to follow a leader who is always real rather than one who is always right. Because there is no such thing of the latter. There is no leader who is always right. But every leader can be real. And when they make mistakes, they say, listen, that was a bad choice. Let's own it. I'll take whatever responsibility we need to take and let's move forward. I'll follow someone like that. Someone who's real. 
But someone who always pretends to always be right, there's something there that's wrong. Because no one's always right. But you can be real. And this is one thing I love about Nehemiah. He lets God take care of him. See, he doesn't see himself as his own provider, his own sustainer, and his own rewarder. Men, some of you do see yourselves that way. Women, some of you do see yourselves that way. Listen, I got to get out there and provide. I've got to get out there and make it happen. Am I saying you shouldn't work hard? Absolutely not. If you don't work hard, you shouldn't eat, in my opinion. And there's something in the Bible about that. But like, if you're not someone who's not willing to work, then hey, I don't know what to say about that other than what the Bible says. Don't eat then. But if you're someone who puts the burden of provision upon your shoulders, you've taken a mantle that's not yours. God does the providing. We do the work. We sow the seed, but God brings the increase. You're not your own sustainer, right? Like, did you know that this church would actually survive without you? Did you know that the world would still spin on its axis if you and I weren't here? God doesn't need me. God doesn't need you, but he wants you. This is what I love about God. He wants you. I'd, I'd like to be in a relationship that's not codependent. You ever been in one of those situations where it's like the person always needs you to death? Like, that's not healthy. But if you're in a situation where it's like, hey, I want to be with you. Like, Phew. Well, this is awesome. This is like a, this is a healthy thing. God gives his best to those who let him take care of them. I'm going to share this illustration real quick. Um, anyone ever heard of Greg Laurie? Anyone ever heard of that name once or twice or ten times? <sighs> Greg has two sons, one in heaven and one on earth. And he used to tell this story of his two boys, that when they were young, he had this kind of parenting style. And this was his parenting style. I kind of like it. I don't know if it's right, but I think it's cool. He said, listen, boys, I'm going to spoil you until you act spoiled, and then we're done. You know what I mean? Like, when we're out, we're going to have fun. But if you start in your attitudes and choices... Becoming spoiled, pff, that gravy train is over, you know? So, oh, that, that sounds good. So he used to take his boys to get, you know, toy shopping or something. And when they were young, he would say, okay, boys, go pick out whatever toy you want. And they'd pick out something. And, and then this one kid, his older son, Christopher, he called him Topher, who's in heaven now. He realized that his dad made better choices than he did. And so Greg tells this story as his boys got older that when they would take him to wherever to get a toy or something, he said, okay, boys, go pick out what you want. He said, Christopher came to me and said, Dad, how about you pick it out? Because the toys that you pick out are awesome. And he made this illustration of the heart of the Father for your life. That God gives his best to those who let him take care of them. Here's what I've found in my own life and in the lives of others I've been connected to. There are some who work extremely hard so that they can have the house and the second house and the third house. There are some that work hard so that they can have the boat and the yacht. There are some that I have encountered that work hard so they can have this experience and that experience and this travel adventure. And all of their work and toil is really self-motivated. I guess that's a way to live. What you strive to attain, you'll always be striving to maintain. And I've met others who work hard. But you know what? They kind of seek first the kingdom in all that they do. And here's what I found in those lives. God gives them situations, houses to stay in, cars to drive, boats to basically be theirs, that they could never afford with all their toil, sweat, and tears. And that's not the motivator of why you do what you do. Your motivator is to please God. But here's kind of like the backsided benefit. God picks out better toys than you do. So why don't you just serve him instead of serving yourself? It's a win-win to serve the Lord. Because whether it's on this side of eternity or next, 
His treasures are always better than the treasures that you could think of. You know, he's kind of the one that's the creator. There's no other creator. The rest of us, we're just organizers of the things that he created. There's no such thing as a creator. There's just one. And everyone else who identifies as a creative, they're just aligning, putting together the things that the creator has already put in place. As we close, let me give you four things to consider, and then we'll, we're going to take communion together this morning. But again, I'm the strange person. I like alliteration, or I need some kind of alignment to understand things. Let me give you four things to remember from this morning. I'm going to call them the A, B, C, Ds of this text. Here's the letter A. Anticipate problems and challenges. Anyone ever heard of Jesus? Okay, now you have. Well, Jesus made this statement in John 16, In this world, you will have roses and rainbows all day long. It's going to be awesome. Nope, that's not in there. That's in 2 Opinionians 16, but it's not in the Bible. <laughs> John 16, Jesus says this, In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. A, anticipate problems and challenge. Every single time in this book that God providentially reveals his plan, the person experiences problem. Every single time God brings a calling into someone's life, there's a challenge. Anticipate problems and challenges. To not do so is naive immature, and setting yourself up for disappointment. B, believe that every problem and challenge is an opportunity for God to work. Nehemiah experienced a problem, but he approached it the right way. Okay, I'm going to think this through. I'm going to respond. I'm going to let call truth for what it is and see what God does. And do you know what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says? God works all things together for good for those that love God and call, are called according to his purpose. You either believe that today through your attitude or you don't. There's no middle ground there. But believe. Make the choice to believe. Letter C. Confront problems and challenges clearly, compassionately, and courageously. If we had the time, I would love to read to you Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. In that passage, Jesus shares very simply how to confront problems and challenges. He says, run from them. Don't face them. It'll just get better. No, he didn't say that. We say, well, what does he say? Read your Bible. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 19, there, go for it. I'm telling you, if you'll start to live that out, you're going to solve a lot of relational problems. Matthew 18, verse 15 through 19, clearly, compassionately, and courageously confront problems and challenges. Think of Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Gosh, Romans is like, is amazing. Chapters 1 through 11 is all orthodoxy. This is what is right. Chapter 12, it pivots. So this is how you should live in light of what is right. I love that about the Bible. It doesn't just say, obey God because the Bible you know, says so. No. There's wisdom behind the call to obedience. Read Romans. But in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21 specifically, Paul speaks to restoring relationships, letting love be without pretense or fakery, but still you confront problems and challenges. You don't think that, well, I'll just be quiet about that and I'm sure it'll get better. You know what? I have found that with plumbing, that doesn't work. Like if I just have a leaky sink, I go, you know, if I just kind of pray about it, Think about it, or don't think about it. Maybe it'll get better. That's never worked in the world of plumbing. And it doesn't work in the relationships in which you have today. 
If you want the Spirit of God to be able to flow into the lives of your family and your friends, stop ignoring challenges and problems. Read Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. Read Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And don't only anticipate problems. Believe that they're an opportunity. But learn to compassionately and clearly and courageously confront them in the way that God describes and prescribes. Fourthly and finally, A, anticipate. B, believe. C, confront. D, develop your own personal and private integrity consistently. Listen, in Nehemiah chapter 4, they were saying gnarly things about Nehemiah. Maybe that's, ever, maybe that's happened to you. People misinterpret your motives or your decisions, and they start to represent you in a way that's not real. Here's the temptation. Well, i got to fix this. I mean, that's my reputation. Let me share this with you. Hold your reputation lightly and your character tightly. Because you live in a generation where communication is instantaneous and permanent. Through social media or email or text, anyone can say anything they want about you instantaneously for the world to see and permanently. It's calculated and collated and organized. You cannot control your reputation, but you do have impact over your character. So hold your reputation lightly and your character tightly. Why do you say that? If you look at Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, that's what he did. Hey, I I can't control what those around me do, but I can control what I do. If you seek to live for your reputation, you're going to go nuts. Because all it takes is one bad apple to mess that up for you. But if you hold your reputation lightly and your character tightly, That's the way forward. And as we close, I want to say something about Jesus in this chapter. In fact, I'm going to invite the worship team up as we kind of prepare our hearts and minds for communion. But I really do believe that one of the greatest things about this chapter are not the ABCDs, you know, anticipate, believe, confront, develop. Those are great. I like the way this chapter kind of breaks down with like, man, see the ruthlessness of the people and then the the reprimand and then the repentance and then the role model. Yeah, that's, that's great. But what I like most about this chapter is what it simply reveals about Jesus. Say, what do you mean? Every single one of us. Well, let me ask you this question. How many of you are actually born of a woman? Any of you? We all have that in common. Can you believe that? There's not a single human being that wasn't born of a woman. Not yet, anyway. But here's the second thing. Some of us also have another thing in common. Not only were we born of a woman, but we're born of the Spirit of God. We've been born twice. See, we were born once. We're all in that boat. And then some of us were born again. Why? Why why be born again? Because when you're born, it's like you're born on this massive ship that's sinking. And everyone born of a woman has a passport on this boat. And it's going down. And God doesn't send any good people to hell. Everyone is on the boat headed to hell because you're born of a woman. And then Jesus, he's like this lifeboat. And God, through situations, circumstances, people, sermons, his own spirit revealing, calls to all of us and says, who wants on the lifeboat? All you got to do is is just receive, just step in. It's free. You know why that can happen? Because every single one of us are under the curse, the ruthlessness of sin, but Jesus took our reprimand. Jesus did. Some of us here are adulterers in our hearts and minds. Some of us are murderers because we hate people. And you know what Jesus says about that? I'll take that consequence. Put that on me. I'll take that reprimand. Some of us are thieves. We steal time from our employers. We don't work hard. We're lazy. And you know what God says? My son, he'll, he'll take the, the consequence for that. 
Some of us are arrogant. We actually think that we're better than the person sitting next to us. We may never articulate that, but our attitude shows that all the time. We actually think we're above people. And Jesus says, I'll take that sentence for pride, for lust, for arrogance, for murder. Jesus took our reprimand. And very simply, he says, for any of those who want this forgiveness, repent and receive. And then Jesus, as that perfect role model, his life becomes your life. He begins to live his very life through you. As you surrender, as you repent, as you make your life all about him, you finally come to life. See, this is what I love about this chapter. The ruthlessness of sin, the reprimand, the repentance, the role model. This shows us Jesus. There's no one else that can do this for you. And Jesus, he died my death so I could live his life. That's what he did for me. I know me. I know what goes on in this head and this heart and with these hands. And I know me well enough to know I, I'm not enough. I don't measure up. There is lack here. There's every sin imaginable. And I need forgiveness. And I'm willing to wager that if I, as a 39-year-old kid from Gulf Breeze, Florida, can recognize that, I need a Savior. I recognize that Jesus, sent his, that Jesus is the sent one from God. I repent, I receive. If I can do that, you can do that. Because I know me. I'm nothing. I know who I am. I'm one that needs to be forgiven. I'm one that needs to be set free. I'm one that's constantly in need of being reminded that I have a future. That one day, one day, there will be no more presence of sin. I need that reminder daily. And that's what this chapter shows me. It shows me that Jesus, man, he's the one that rebuilds. He's the one that restores. He's the one that's greater than Nehemiah. And what I want to do this morning with you as we close our time together, through this simple act of communion, remember that Jesus has the ability to save, to rebuild, to restore. But let me have your attention. Let me have your eyes. Only, only if you repent. That's the door. That's your part. You have to give full and complete surrender to the sovereign. That's what it is. Jesus isn't an additive to your already crowded life. He wants lordship. And I didn't say this, but I do believe it's true. You know what? You have to ask this question. That if Jesus is not Lord of all, how could he be Lord at all? Because if you have a Lord, you don't come on a Monday and go, well, not today, Lord. You know, like, no, <laughs> he's the Lord. Whatever Monday's going to look like, he's going to tell you. He's in charge. But I'm telling you, he's a gracious father. He's good, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's forgiving and loving, he's faithful, he's restorative. And the life that he offers is a life of zoe, fullness. It's the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy.